It's beginning to rain, rain, rain in the voice of our Father. Saying, who with the ever will come drink of this water? I promise to pour my spirit out on your sons and your daughters. If you're thirsty and dry, look up to the sky. It's beginning. Hello friends, this is Tex Mars, inviting you to worship with us today at Bible Home Church, coming to you from Austin, Texas. Hello friends, this is Jerry Barrett, the pastor's assistant here at Bible Home Church. Please remember that Bible Home Church operates solely through your love gifts, tithes, and offerings. You can mail a check or money order to Bible Home Church, 1708 Patterson Road, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N Road, Austin, Texas, 78733, or you can donate through PayPal on our website. Don't forget to send in your prayer requests as well. We will be happy to add you to our prayer list, and we greatly appreciate your prayers for us. This week, we will begin a new series The Shocking Truth About Jesus Christ. We pray that you will receive a blessing from Pastor Mars' message. Up next is Sonia Isaacs Yeary with Down to the River to Pray, after which we will begin Pastor Mars' sermon. to pray studying about that good old way and who shall wear a starry crown good lord show me the way oh sisters let's go down come on down come on down oh sisters let's go down down in the river to pray as I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me Oh, brothers, let's go down, come on down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down in the river to As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear a starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down, come on down, come on down. Oh, fathers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down, come on down, don't you want to go down? Come on, mothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, come on down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me.
Well, today I'm going to talk about my favorite subject of all time. That's right. This is my favorite topic ever. And uh, uh, what is the topic? Well, it's about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is my favorite topic. But, but listen, listen now, hear this, my friends. This is going to be a different Jesus than the world will tell you about. I'm going to tell you about a man who, well, obviously, he's a very dangerous criminal. He's a person that, well, if we just follow government, federal government guidelines, he's somebody to be uh, avoided at all costs. He's a, he's a dangerous man uh, into all kinds of mischief. In fact, this Jesus, now this is the shocking truth, but I'm here to tell you he is extremely politically <laughs> incorrect. Yes, this is this is a Jesus that the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Baptists and the Pentecostals and the Catholics and the Lutherans and Episcopals, it doesn't matter. They, none of them want you to know about. It's a, certainly a Jesus that Pope John Paul II doesn't know, nor does President George W. Bush. And and I, I just feel like it's my responsibility to let you know about him. You, you <laughs> There's a possibility if you do believe and worship this Jesus, you, you could be worshiping the wrong man. And I, I just want to let you know that there is another Jesus. Now, I don't believe in this other Jesus myself. He's talked about in Galatians chapter 1. And Paul said if you believe in him, you believe in a cursed Jesus. And then in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 4, Paul said there is uh, this uh, another Jesus, but also another gospel. You see, the, the other gospel that's discussed in there in Corinthians and Galatians is cursed by God. Now, I'm going to tell you right up front, I believe, in fact, I say, praise the Lord for this politically incorrect Jesus. He's the one I worship. And I guess that stamps me as a different kind of a character than most of the pastors of this world. In fact, I don't know but a small handful that believe like I do. That's right. I believe 100% in this politically incorrect Jesus, the one the world doesn't want to recognize, the one that they would love to crucify if he were to come again in the flesh. You say they wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, they would. I mean, when you find out what kind of man this really is, the whole world would want to get rid of him. In fact, Revelation says he's going to send two witnesses in the last days, and the whole world is going to be so angry they're going to kill his two witnesses, basically spit on and revile their bodies as they lie in the street of Jerusalem. And then the whole world, everybody in the world is going to turn around and give each other gifts, presents. There's going to be a world festival, a holiday to celebrate the killing, the murder of Jesus' two witnesses. Now, if, if they would do that to his two witnesses, can you imagine what they would do that to Jesus himself if he came back in the flesh? Even if they say, no, we wouldn't do that, why we're all people of harmony and love and peace. Don't believe them. When they find out this Jesus, <laughs> the real Jesus is politically incorrect, they're going to want to kill him. And let me tell you something, if you go out there and tell people you believe in this politically incorrect Jesus that I'm going to describe to you in the moment, they might just want to kill you too. You better be careful. Now I propose though, if you really want to be a troublemaker, sort of like Jeremiah and Elijah and John the Baptist and so forth, you can tell people about this politically incorrect Jesus. They won't believe it. They'll say, well, I never heard this. I've sat in the pulpit of my Presbyterian or Lutheran or Episcopal church or whatever for years. I've never heard about this man. But it's all right there. You see, most of the pastors don't go to this book I have in my hand called the Holy Bible. 
That's where it describes this politically incorrect Jesus. They just make up stories that aren't even true about him and preach little homilies to people. Well, I went to the actual source itself. I went to the book that this Jesus wrote. Jesus cannot deny. In fact, I, I know for certain he would never deny what he wrote in his book. So don't listen to the pastors. Don't listen to the televangelists. Let's find out what Jesus wrote. Now, I'm going to describe to you. I'm going to sort of take, oh, I don't like to take this kind of angle, but I'm sort of going to be like the devil's advocate. I'm going to sort of let you know what the world would have to say about this Jesus, this shockingly politically incorrect Jesus. You're going to find out what a big troublemaker and a monster he is, according to the world. You see, I believe if Jesus Christ came back in the flesh today and allowed it, because he's God, he, obviously no one can overcome him, even temporarily unless he allows it. But if he allowed it, he would be hounded, harassed, vilified, bullied, arrested, convicted, and no doubt crucified because he's so extremely politically incorrect. He's, he would be in violation, if he started up his ministry again and operated the way he did the first time, he would be in violation of environmental laws, public policy favoring homosexuals, IRS rules regarding tax-exempt religious groups, weapons laws. He'd be hated because of his bias against homosexuals and his preaching against pro-abortion child killers. He'd be arrested for violating mortuary regulations, for counterfeiting money, for harming animals, for defying wage waiver laws for using public lands without a permit, for practicing medicine without a license, for producing wine without a permit, for minting his own money. He'd be branded an intolerant bigot, brought up on hate crimes, accused by the media of being anti-government, laughed at as a conspiracy theorist. He'd be labeled a potentially violent militia leader, charged as an illegal alien, and deemed a threat to families. And I hadn't even started yet. <laughs> and I can document everything that I said, I have a special interest in this politically incorrect Jesus, you see, because my ministry has been vilified, hounded, harassed, and threatened for a number of years by the federal authorities and the others. I, we were audited for four years in a row by the IRS because we're politically incorrect. It ended up with us not owing one cent. I mean, all all we had to spend was thousands of dollars for lawyers and attorneys, but uh, and and for for accountants. But it ended up with the IRS not getting one cent from us and being forced to restore our tax exempt status, which we promptly told them we didn't want anyway. Not after what they did, what they can do. We don't want to be tax exempt. <laughs> we want to be politically incorrect. I want to worship the politically incorrect Jesus and keep my integrity. And then we bought a piece of land to build, a new, to, to build a new office building on it. We needed some more office space for the ministry. And the city and the federal government told us we couldn't because of some endangered species habitat they found on that. Well, actually, they didn't find any on it, but they said some bird might light on that land, might fly for miles away and land on it. So they couldn't, they wouldn't let us build. So we were hounded and harassed, you know, for environmental reasons. Everywhere we turn, it seems to be we're harassed today. But we don't complain too much. I mean, think of what they would do to Jesus if he were to return. I, what they're doing to us is almost nothing. But it'll get worse in time. Now listen to me very carefully. Let me read to you 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 3, it says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguile Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. What is Paul saying there? He says, retain the simplicity of the gospel. 
And he says, there will be some who will come and preach another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And he recommends you bear with them, meaning dispute with them, argue with them. Tell them, no, we're not going to accept another Jesus. Today I'm going to tell you about the real Jesus and all the reasons why the world would hate such a man as this. But all the more so, my friends, why we should cleave to him. First of all, now again, I'm, it's going to be sort of like a devil's advocate thing here. I'm going to tell you all the reasons why Jesus is so terribly politically incorrect. And I suspect most of you have never heard of these things, but listen very closely. First of all, Jesus' ministry, let's just assume now that Jesus came back and he operated the same kind of ministry that he had back 2,000 years ago. First of all, his ministry could not be 501c3 tax exempt, couldn't be approved by the IRS because he opposes public policy. For one thing, divorce is legal, he opposes divorce. He opposes homosexuality, and the gay agenda is the biggest thing since sliced salami in Washington today. Jesus' ministry w would, was not registered as a charity. It wasn't performing in accordance with 501c3 rules about charity. Look at some of the things they said about Jesus' ministry and what the IRS and the, the media could say today. They'd have a field day. For example, Jesus' treasure was Judas. He was said to be an embezzler. Boy, they could really write up a story on that, couldn't they? And remember that instance in the Bible when, 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 when a woman uh, bent down on her knees and took an expensive bottle of perfume or ointment from an alabaster box and poured it out on Jesus? And then his disciples complained. They said, we could have taken the money for that. It was so expensive and given it to the poor. But Jesus rebuked him and said, the poor will always be with you. Oh, my. You know, it seems to me, wow. Jesus, the money of his organization was not being used for charitable purpose, but you're being used for his own private interest. <laughs> and he doesn't seem to be in sympathy with the poor. He says, the poor will always be with you. Now here's another instance why Jesus' ministry could not receive 501c3 approval from the IRS and be a tax-exempt organization. Do you remember he talked about the, the widow who gave a mite? She gave everything she had. All she had was a mite. Jesus praised her. Well, now, you know what the world would say about that? He was just trying to rob little old widows. He took their last mite. He said it was more desirable than contributions from the rich. What a, what a mean man. And you know, there were some suspicious activities right from the beginning. A devil's advocate would say, after all, isn't it true? Right there in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, it says Jesus had some aliases. Did you know that? I mean, anybody that has an alias, you have to look out for them. Like Jesus said that he was called... Emmanuel? Wow. Aliases. Sounds like a dangerous man, doesn't it? Listen to this. He obviously told people to take things without paying. Let me just read to you. He, he, he read from Isaiah, it says in the Bible. Well, let me read to you what Isaiah says, chapter 55. It says, everyone that thirsteth, this is verse 1 now. Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye by and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wow. Was he recommending people just go to the stores and steal things? Could be interpreted that way by the world. Hmm. And then he was not a nice man. You know, aren't we supposed to speak kindly of other ministers and pastors and the Mormons and the Masons and the, the I mean, that's what I get letters. They say, text, you're so mean. You say bad things about Masons and Mormons and Catholics and Jews, and you say bad things about Buddhists and Hindus. But, but look at Isaiah. It says, talks about, 
in, in chapter 56, verses 9 through 12. It says, his watchmen are blind, they are all ignorant, they are all dumb dogs. Verse 11 says, yea, they are greedy dogs. Now that's not nice to call somebody a dumb and greedy dog, is it? Now let's look at Jesus and let's see other reasons why he was politically incorrect. Pitifully so. His parents fled to Egypt shortly after his birth. Now why did they do that? I mean, a prosecutor may look at that and say, hmm, what do they have to hide? And did you know that Jesus was not counted in the census that was being taken at the time? Why wasn't he counted in the census? What were they trying to hide? Well, of course, you know, politically incorrect. We know here that he's uneducated. He was from a backwoods region. Galilee, Nazareth. Uneducated. Hmm. Being politically correct, I mean, every Baptist church today is all looking for a guy who's got a doctorate from a seminary. Jesus didn't have a doctorate. He was a son of a carpenter. He'd be unfit to even preach in a church today. His followers were unlearned. One of them was just a fisherman, a dumb old fisherman, some would say. And then look how prejudiced Jesus was. Did you know he chose for his disciples 12 men where are the women there? Feminists of the world jump up in anger. This Jesus was politically incorrect. He chose 12 white men. One of them was an angry white man, too. At one time, it was reported that he cut off the ears of somebody. Angry white man. And you know what? Those 12 white men, they were all of the same ethnic group, the same religion. If you're thirsty and dry, listening to Pastor Tex Mars and Bible Home Church. Please join with us in worship next week as we continue to honor the remarkable Word of God. friends, this is Tex Mars, inviting you to worship with us today at Bible Home Church, coming to you from Austin, Texas. Hello, friends. This is Jerry Barrett, the pastor's assistant here at Bible Home Church. Please remember that Bible Home Church operates solely through your love gifts, tithes, and offerings. You can mail a check or money order to Bible Home Church, 1708 Patterson Road, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N Road, Austin, Texas, 78733, or you can donate through PayPal on our website. Don't forget to send in your prayer requests as well. We will be happy to add you to our prayer list, and we greatly appreciate your prayers for us. This week, we continue the series, The Shocking Truth About Jesus Christ. We pray that you will receive a blessing from Pastor Mars' message. Up next is Glenn Campbell with Show Me Your Way, after which we will begin Pastor Mars' sermon. When I find myself in sadness And fear of all to which I tread I climb the stairs of gladness And face the light of God instead As I wander through the darkness I search for all that's truth and right To walk the paths of glory See the lamp of God's true light Show me your way, O oh Lord And let me sing all oh, praise to Thee Take my heart and hear my prayer I need Your love to show
I feel the world awaken The wonder of your gentle hand Will touch all hearts arising And change the empty course of men know here that he's uneducated. He was from a backwoods region, Galilee, Nazareth, uneducated. Hmm. Being politically correct, I mean, every Baptist church today is all looking for a guy who's got a doctorate from a seminary. Jesus didn't have a doctorate. He was a son of a carpenter. He'd be unfit to even preach in a church today. His followers were unlearned. One of them was just a fisherman. A dumb old fisherman, some would say. And then look how prejudiced Jesus was. Did you know he chose for his disciples 12 men? Where are the women there? Feminists of the world jump up in anger. This Jesus was politically incorrect. He chose 12 white men. One of them was an angry white man too. At one time he, it was reported that he cut off the ears of somebody. Angry white man. And you know what? Those 12 white men, they were all of the same ethnic group, the same religion. Does that sound diverse to you? He didn't believe in diversity. Jesus had to be a bigot and a hater. He chose 12 white men, all of the same ethnic group and race, and all of the same religious background to be his disciples. You feminists, come on, get on your high horses. Now, here's something. Jesus healed people, it said in the Bible. He healed a leper. He healed a, healed a blind man. He healed somebody that had palsy. There was a woman that had a blood disease. Obviously, this is medicine, practicing medicine without a license. Do we have documented proof? They were healed. Well, yes, there were witnesses there. Well, even the more so, he probably ought to be arrested. Practicing medicine without a license. And then he said he cast out devils. You know what, my friends? The American Psychiatric Association could complain about that. I mean, one of these devils was out in the... I mean, one of these guys that had these devils supposedly was out in the tombs. Now, psychiatrists would say he had multiple personality disorder, MPD. Because he, he said he had, a, he, had a, he had a legion, you know, must have maybe thousands of spirits that possessed his body. What a horrible psychiatric disorder. Jesus didn't know anything about psychiatry, though. He didn't promote psychology. He just cast out those devils, they said. Well, there again, he was practicing medicine without a license, practicing psychology without a license. He, he, he probably should have read a couple of good books on multiple personality disorder. But as far as I know, he never read any books like that. Jesus didn't. Didn't have libraries back then, uh, as far as I know. And so it seems to me, here again, politically incorrect. Now, 
talk about being an anti-environmentalist. This guy was politically incorrect. Did you know that, he, that Jesus once stated, quote, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire? That's not a good environmentalist. Recommending that people just, I mean, come on. It's still a beautiful tree. It's still part of Mother Earth, part of us. We're all connected. We're all the, the cycle of life, the circle of life. And he says, just cut it down and cast it into the fire if it doesn't bring forth good fruit. Besides, isn't, isn't that an incitement to destroy and burn forest? Burn it down. Oh, my, he's politically incorrect. Read Mark chapter 11, verses 19 through 23. Did you know that he once damaged a fig tree? His disciples saw a fig tree that had dried up from his roots and had died. And they said unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursed and has withered away. He just cursed some tree and it withered away. Well, now come on. Did he have that much power? Did he, did he do something? Did he, did he put some terrible insecticide or poison on that tree? That fig tree just withered away? Is that what a good environmentalist does? And listen to this one. Besides that, he used public lands, as far as I know, without a permit. Remember when he said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not to lay his head? He went out and lived out in the, in the, the countryside, in the wilderness, but, but he didn't have any permit to do that. And then there was the case of 5,000 men, women, and children at one of his meetings there at, at some mountain area. Gave what he called the Sermon on the Mount. Well, first of all, he fed them. And you know, he did not have a food establishment license. How do we know the food was sa sanitary? As far as I know, there were no Johns there. There were no sanitary facilities. Did he, did he really provide for this crowd? I, did he get a permit from the local authorities? No, he didn't do anything like that. Was there any inspection by, by medical personnel or by, by, you know, food and drug administration people of those fishes and loaves? There was not as far as the Bible says. I mean, that's all kind of public laws. Regulations being broken there. Now listen to this one. We can go on and on with the laws this guy broke. This Jesus. Mortuary regulations. Did you know he raised a man from the dead? Well, first of all, he left behind the unsanitary linens. The guy just took his linens off and walked, they said. He, and he, he took, I mean, first of all, can undertakers and mortuary people do that, raise people from the dead? No, they cannot. Why, here in the state of Texas, they got to put formaldehyde in the bodies. Well, that'll make sure they don't raise again. You know what this Jesus had the gall to say one time? He said, let the dead bury their dead. Now, would that work good in society? That's why we need funeral homes and such. The dead can't bury their dead. There was a funeral uh, guy that was supposed to cremate bodies in Georgia or somewhere down there, and he didn't do it, and he just let the dead bury the dead, and pretty soon three or 400 bodies were collected. Would Jesus have done such a thing? I mean, you can really get make a case against this guy. He could be misunderstood. And then there's the animal cruelty. Now, you animal lovers out there, get ready to get mad. This guy was politically incorrect. This Jesus, did you know when he cast out those devils from the man at the tombs? It said in the Bible there, a herd of swine, those are pigs, they ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. They were so frightened of Jesus. Killed a whole herd of swine of pigs. Boy, I tell you, that was reported on the news today. They'd be finding out who that man was who ran a whole herd of pigs over a cliff. And listen to this one. He, he obviously, was he a thief? We have to investigate this one. Did you know that in one instance he told his disciples to steal? Well, now maybe not steal, but we don't have any evidence that he owned it. To ride, that he needed a donkey? He said, just go get that donkey, and when they ask you why you're taking him, just say, because the master has need of him. Well, a lot of people have needs of things, but they don't tell their disciples, go out and take it. Besides that, we don't have any evidence that this pet donkey had ID tags and vaccinations and had seen a vet locally and all that kind of stuff. There he was being rode down the, the road in Jerusalem. Uh, listen to this. Here, here's, here's another thing. 
You know there's laws against making counterfeit money. There is evidence presented in the Holy Scriptures that Jesus once told his followers, you can find a coin, a very valuable coin, in the mouth of a fish. And they, boy, they did. They got this fish and they opened its mouth and there was a valuable coin for them to buy for all their needs. Now some would say that's a miracle, but if you're a devil's advocate, you would say, wait just a minute. This sounds like this was rigged. Didn't this Jesus actually put the coin in the mouth of the fish and throw the fish into the water? And then he, he must have known that his disciples would fish right there and get that exact fish. Maybe it was the only one in that area. I mean, I don't know how to do that. I mean, this guy must have been very clever to have made sure that they caught exactly that fish. But in any case, whatever is the case, that coin was not minted at the mint house of the government. Only the government has the right to mint and manufacture coins and currency. And if you do it, you can claim it's a miracle all you want, but you're going to go to jail. That's counterfeiting. Maybe Jesus broke the law. And I have evidence of it in Matthew 17, verses 25 through 27. That's not all. Listen to this. This Jesus is so politically incorrect. He discriminates against homosexuality. D say that again. He discriminates against homosexuals. You want proof? Okay, here it is. Here it is. Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. Jesus was quoted as saying, quote, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause a man shall leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the twain shall be as one? Where is the same sex marriages here? There's none that I can see. This Jesus was against same sex marriage. And here's another one. Mark chapter 10 verse 7 he said, but from the beginning of the creation, this is Jesus' words, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. No, there's some people that he made half male and half female or sort of a, a grand duke mixture or androgynous uh, or hermaphrodite. I mean, come on. That's what they say today. The gays say, I was born this way. This is the way God made me. It's natural. It's divinely ordered. Jesus said, uh-uh. God only made male and female. Now here's something that you people that are interested in promoting the labor laws and the U.S. Uh, the Department of Labor and all of your state labor bureaus. Did you know that Jesus recommended the paying of a different wage to different people doing the same job? Ooh. In Matthew 20, we're told of some who worked all day out in the heat, and they only received the same wage as those who worked an hour. And Jesus had the audacity to attempt to justify this by telling the workers, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Now try to get away with that if you're an employer today. One works one hour, one works eight and the ones that work eight say, you're paying that guy the same as me, and he only worked an hour? And then for you to turn around and say, well, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. I bet you'd say, uh-uh, I'm going to see my EOC officer. I'm going to complain to the union. I'm going to get you in trouble, buddy. You're not a fair employer. You're not politically correct. Now, friends, please understand, I may be operating as the devil's advocate, which I don't really like to do, so that I can show you what the world thinks about the real Jesus Christ, the one described so accurately in the Bible. But this is the Jesus Christ that we love, that we recommend, that we believe in. And we've given you many programs in the past explaining exactly why he should be worshipped and loved. The greatest hero of all time. He laid down his life for his friends. The most wonderful person you could ever meet. Oh, what a glorious time we're going to have with Jesus. But meanwhile, listen to this. I mean, in heaven. But listen to this. We want to go on with some of the things that make him politically incorrect. I was telling you that we were going to look into also 
the fact that Jesus, if he had a ministry today, operating basically the way his ministry did when he came in the flesh, John 1, uh, some 2,000 years ago, he would get in a lot of trouble. First of all, did not Jesus break fish and wildlife regulations? Didn't he also violate the Endangered Species Act? Well, let's, let's look at that. Remember Jesus admitted to fishing? The Bible says that he was fishing, and, and I don't think there's any evidence that he had a license, and every locale and state now require a license. And you know, there's a catch limit. I know down here on the Gulf of Mexico and Texas, I'm not a big fisherman. I've just played around a little bit, haven't done a good job of fishing, but the friends that, that, that are of mine, they tell me that you can only catch so many of certain kinds of fish. Well, Jesus one time assisted his disciples and they threw their nets into a certain place and they caught so many fish, it broke their net. It filled up two ships full of fish that, uh, that had to violate the catch limit. And how do we know that he wasn't fishing out of season? We don't. And listen to this, you environmentalists. Doesn't it make you angry? The Bible doesn't say that there were any safeguards to make sure that no dolphins or other protected species were not entrapped in those nets. You know, you, you see these little tuna fish cans and it says, you know, dolphin free or something like that. <laughs> now, let's move to another area. You know, a lot of people would say that Jesus is politically incorrect because he was so anti-government. Now, I know a lot of Christians say, oh, no, he was a big supporter of the government. Well, let's just look at the evidence, my friends. Let's look at the evidence. Did he not call the head of government, King Herod, a derogatory name? Remember that? He called him that old fox. Hmm. And you know, when he was in King Herod's presence, all Herod asked for was for him to do a little magic, and Jesus just stood there mute. Wasn't that disrespectful to government? Refused to say anything. Later on, they, you know, in front of Pilate, he also refused to speak at first. Wouldn't defend himself. Very uncooperative witness, wasn't he? Hmm. And you know what? He had to be anti-government because he claimed to be a king. If you're thirsty and dry, look to the sky, it's beginning to rain. You've been listening to Pastor Tex Mars and Bible Home Church. Please join with us in worship next week as we continue to honor the remarkable Word of God. Tex Mars, inviting you to worship with us today at Bible Home Church, coming to you from Austin, Texas. Hello, friends. This is Jerry Barrett, the pastor's assistant here at Bible Home Church. Please remember that Bible Home Church operates solely through your love gifts, tithes, and offerings. You can mail a check or money order to Bible Home Church, 1708 Patterson Road, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N Road, Austin, Texas, 78733, or you can donate through PayPal on our website. Don't forget to send in your prayer requests as well. We will be happy to add you to our prayer list, and we greatly appreciate your prayers for us. This week, we conclude this series the shocking truth about Jesus Christ. We pray that you will receive a blessing from Pastor Mars's message. Up next is the Kingsman with Who Am I? 
After which, we will begin Pastor Mars's sermon. at the evidence. Did he not call the head of government, King Herod, a derogatory name? Remember that? He called him that old fox. Hmm. And you know, when he was in King Herod's presence, all Herod asked for was for him to do a little magic, and Jesus just stood there mute. Wasn't that disrespectful to government? Refused to say anything. Later on, they, you know, in front of Pilate, he also refused to speak at first. Wouldn't defend himself. Very uncooperative witness, wasn't he? Hmm. And you know what? He had to be anti-government because he claimed to be a king. But, of course, even back then they said he had no legitimate claim to a kingdom. And it seems that the world today also says Jesus doesn't have any legitimate claim to a kingdom. Doesn't seem like there's many people out there that want to be part of his kingdom. And even Jesus testified there would only be the few. And most would go the other pathway. Now, the Bible also tells us, presents evidence That Jesus once said that if he wanted to, he could order his servants to fight against the legally constituted head of government. That's what he told the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Hey, 
in today's 9-11 environment, that could be a terrorist threat. I mean, what if I were to tell the FBI or the local police, hey, if I wanted to, I could order my servants to fight against this government. I could war against you if I wanted to. Oh, my, you'd be, you'd be threatening the government, wouldn't you? Hmm. You, you, could, be, you could be hauled up under cons, uh, 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 conspiracy to commit terrorism charges. Certainly, Jesus was a conspiracy theorist, wasn't he? Did you know that he testified all kinds of things that were going to happen? He prophesied, for example, that there would be another kingdom coming? That that government of Israel would fall? What if I were to go around today? What if Jesus were to come back today and say, this America is going to fall? The sins of this country are so bad, this whole nation is going to fall. Well, they would start, start to say, you're blaming America for what the terrorists did. Remember Jerry Falwell said that the homosexuals and the others were responsible because of their sins for what happened at the World Trade Center, and everybody jumped on the bandwagon and criticized poor old Jerry Falwell, and then Jerry Falwell apologized and said, I didn't mean it, I'm sorry. Well, Jesus, I know, would not apologize. He would say, your sins will bring you destruction. Blame yourself, he would say. And then people would get so mad. He was a conspiracy theorist. He believed there was a conspiracy against him. He often talked about the conspiracy against him. Maybe he was paranoid. Politically incorrect. Now, as I mentioned to you, Jesus was, his birth was never recorded on census records. So if he were arrested, the authorities would find that out and say, you must be an illegal alien. You don't have a social security card. You don't have a social security number. You're not on the census records. Then they would find about the fact that his parents, right after he was born, fled to Egypt. Well, what if somebody's parents fled to Mexico or Canada right after their child was born? What are they trying to hide? Maybe they're illegal aliens. Maybe they broke the law. Maybe they need to be investigated. You know, one time Jesus warned, the scriptures say, he warned that the kingdom would be given to an, would be taken away from Israel and given to another nation. Wow, that sounds like a threat to commit treason. We're going to give this nation to another nation. Sounds like treason. Politically incorrect. And you know, he certainly did associate with foreigners. Remember those Samaritans? Hmm. It all looks suspicious. He was not on the census records. His parents had fled away to Egypt right after he was born. He talked about being king of some other place, some other nation. And he talked about giving that, the nation up to another nation, letting another nation take it over. And he associated with foreigners. All of these seem to be very suspicious activities. Now let's turn to the problem with wine. Oh, yes. There's some liquor law violations that this man seemed to have violated. Now, you Southern Baptists particularly might be interested in this. Because it seems there's a report in the scriptures that Jesus and his mother served liquor, that is, wine to guests. Now, there was no evidence that it had a tax stamp on it. There was no evidence that there had been a license to manufacture and produce wine. They say Jesus made it himself. Well, you authorities, you... Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearm, you may want to take note on that. You didn't get your tax money. You know, I, I don't know for sure, but they tell me that most liquor and liquor stores, that most of the, the price of that is taxes, federal taxes. Jesus didn't pay that tax. He just made that wine. And by reports, by the way, they said it was the, seemed to be about the best wine they had ever tasted. They said he saved it, in fact, for his guest to last. Huh. BATF, take notice. Here's, a, here's a, obviously a criminal. 
And you know, that would be, that wouldn't be too bad making wine without a license, but this guy seemed to have a violent character, this Jesus. Now, I'm just being the devil's advocate, friends, but look at it. One time he said, and this is, this is quoted now by, by witnesses, he can't get out of this. And I don't think he would even try. He said, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am come not to send peace, but a sword. Hey, David Koresh said something like that, and they burned him and all of his followers to death. That guy up at Ruby Ridge, what was his name? Will you remember it? He said something like that. I mean, not quite that. They came and shot his wife in the head, shot his little boy in the back. What do you think they'd do to Jesus if he came back again? And here he says, I, don't, I haven't come to send peace on earth. I've come to send a sword. Violent. And he was divisive. Well, there's no doubt about that. Here's another statement this politically incorrect man made. He said, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Boy, Whew, all you peacemakers. I mean, that, this is a religion of divisiveness that he came to give. He said one time he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Well, I don't know. The, who are the goats? Looks like a threat. He must have a list. In fact, I've heard that Jesus does make a list. He's got a list. He's keeping names of who he's going to destroy and who he's going to save when he takes over the kingdom. I'm telling you, man, that, that sounds very frightening to me that he's got an, a list of people that he considers sheep and one is goats, and these here are going to be, be, be burned to death and destroyed by him and his disciples. Sounds violent to me. I mean, I think I could convince a court that this is a dangerous man here in a world where we have a bunch of liberal judges today. I mean, these are judges that want to take out the words under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance. And they sure wouldn't go for a man calling himself Lord of the world, Lord of the universe, in fact, and wants to bring division. Listen to this. One time he, he was quoted as saying, he would send forth his angels and they're going to gather all that oppose him. And he, he's going to cast them into a furnace of fire. You know what a judge would do to a man like that? Well, as a minimum, he would have probably 500 hours of community service to do. And then he would be forced to go to a, a, a clinic because he has a problem with his intolerance. A hate crime here is being committed. And listen, talk about a violent act. Now, if you made a threat to bomb an IRS building or a federal building, and I don't recommend you do that by any means, friends. Don't do that because they're looking for people making those kind of threats, even if it's an idle threat. Don't make any threats. In fact, I recommend you don't do it. But listen to this man, this Jesus. He said, do you see that temple? Every stone will be thrown down, stone by stone. What if I walked up to an IRS building and I said, you see that building? Every stone's going to be thrown down, stone by stone. Every brick is going to be torn down. They'd have me in chains, my friends, and I'd have witnesses against me, conspiracy to, to, to do whatever, to damage that building. Oh, that put me in prison for about 60 years. I'd certainly be politically correct. This man's dangerous. Violent character. But was there any evidence? These are just words. Was there any evidence of his violent character? Oh, yes. Listen, all you people that think that Jesus was a namby-pamby guy that just preached love, tolerance, and harmony, listen to this one. Matthew 21 will prove he, he had a temper. He had a temper tantrum. He was prone to that, obviously. If I was the devil's advocate, I'd try to prove it. But I think I could. All those witnesses, hundreds probably. He went into this temple, and he actually threw people out. He overthrew the tables of, of these people. All they were doing was just exchanging money and such. And then he used loud and abusive language, accusing them. Man, politically incorrect, wasn't he? You know, I'm getting to get a little frightened of this Jesus myself. Just thinking, 
how politically incorrect he was. But, but listen, here's another one. I mean, this just takes the cake. Luke chapter 19, verse 27. He says, but those, this is what Jesus' words, he says, but those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay before me. Did you know Jesus said that? That the king, when he becomes king someday, he will bring his enemies the ones who said, we will not have you to reign over us as our king. And he will say, bring them before me and slay them. My, my. That's violent. That's scary. That's frightening. I mean, I don't know of anybody that's making threats like this today. Even the leaders of these little militias out there that were really not much of anything, they didn't make threats like this. Can you imagine what they'd be saying about you on CNN, ABC, CBS, and so forth if you were to go around making a threat like this? And then you were going into a church building and throwing tables upside down and accusing people with your finger, finger pointing at them. And then you're pointing to, to big buildings and saying every stone's going to be thrown down. I'm telling you, I mean, this guy... He needed to be locked up if the world had its way. Well, some, somebody told me that Jesus today would be in trouble for all kinds of things. Did you know that he taught without a teaching certificate? I guess the National Education Association would get a hold of him on that. And somebody said <laughs> he promised to bring people to heaven and give them a mansion and, and a friend of mine wanted to know if he's got zoning approval from the zoning department to build those mansions. <laughs> do, they, do they meet the code? Well, there's so many things we could talk about today about Jesus. But, you know, it strikes me, my friends, this politically correct Jesus wants you to be just like him. In John 20, verse 21, it says, As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Now, if you're of Jesus Christ, if you're born again in Him, did you know we're supposed to be as much like Him as we can? And if He was politically correct, then you have to be politically correct, incorrect. And if you're politically incorrect to the extent that Jesus was, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, my friends. You say, well, I'd never do all those things that Jesus did. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to get in trouble with the authorities. Well, listen to John chapter 14, verse 12. It said, he that believeth in me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do. My, my, you're in big trouble, friends. Whether you know it or not, the minute that you accept Jesus Christ as Lord, you've got a great burden of responsibility on you to follow him, to find out what kind of politically correct man he was, and be as much like him as you can. Now, I'll admit you cannot be exactly like him. Nobody could. I'd like to be like Jesus, but I'm just going to have to do my best because, I mean, he took the cake. He's the Lord. He's the king. And, and he was politically incorrect. You know, some people might say, well, you've skewed things, Tex. You took things out of context. I don't think so. I think a full understanding of Jesus would prove my point. He was politically incorrect. And you know what I say, my friends here? We testify. Praise God for the wonderful man who came in the flesh. He was God. But he didn't uh, uh, attempt to be arrogant or bold about that. He simply loved his fellow man. Yes, he was politically incorrect. And I say, he was Savior. If you're thirsty and dry, look to the sky, it's beginning to rain. You've been listening to Pastor Tex Mars and Bible Home Church. Please join with us in worship next week as we continue to honor the remarkable Word of God.